They were a group of individuals determined to make their dreams come true. These deserving players spent so many months in the amateur scene with almost no success until they came together. Each player had sacrificed so much to chase this dream and some were ready to call it quits after repeated losses and failed attempts. This is a story about determination and perseverance. My name is Kudo and this is the history of Complexity Black. In June of 2013, MLG Anaheim hosted a spring championship tournament for amateur teams who were not yet in the LCS. The first place team would qualify into the Season 4 LCS Spring Promotion Tournament. One of the four teams that participated in this tournament was FX Open Esports. The team consisted of West Rice in the top lane, Heaven Time in the jungle, Arthalon at the mid lane, Robert X Lee as the AD carry, and Nidus Hermain as support. This roster was able to take first place in this tournament, emerging victorious in two best of threes against Curse Academy and the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster. Roster. After MLG Anaheim, the roster left FX Open and formed a new team called To Be Determined. Throughout the summer of 2013, To Be Determined remained dominant within the amateur scene, with notable accomplishments such as an 11 to finish in the Mobile Fire Challenger Series and 4th place overall in the playoffs. The team also competed in the 2013 PAX Prime Spring Promotion Qualifier but lost to the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster. In September, the team would go through some changes. On September 24th, Nidus Hermain departed from the team to join Gold Gaming LA. But Dove replaced him in the support role. Around the same time, the team started to have performance issues in the jungle. Heaven Time was also going to step down from the team, so to be determined decided to try out a new jungler during a North American Challenger League match. It was during week one of the league against Napkins in Disguise, and this new jungler played under Heaven Time's account because he did not own a North American League account. This jungler's name is Broken Shard. Playing in terrible latency conditions from Israel, with 220 ping as Lee Sin, Broken Shard impressed the team despite these circumstances. Broken Shard was able to secure first blood in this match. If you are running like any sport, I don't, I don't know. You're not you trying to get it. caught right here. <laughs> the sun comes out and there it goes. West Rice gets a three man taunt over the wall. Glee Blabber gets focused down and taken out by Heaven Time for the first oh one. West Rice flashing over the wall with Scuba Chris chasing after that one though. Bubba Dub gonna get focused out here. Tumble comes in, Ignite comes out, and Scuba Chris is destroying, uh, is getting destroyed here by Heaven Time who is chasing him out. Four members come in. A three man barrel connects from Arthalon. Broken Jet contributed in the team fights and skirmishes, and in the end, to be determined, won the game. However, the win was deemed illegitimate by NACL, who penalized to be determined for using an illegal substitute in Heaven Time's place. NACL staff cited evidence that included an accidental flash from the Heaven Time account at 2 minutes and 33 seconds on the game clock. When the Heaven Time account was securing red buff, the player accidentally flashed instead of smiting the buff. This was sufficient evidence, as Broken Shard and Heaven Time bind their summoner spells in the opposite keys. Despite this, Broken Shard improved the team with both his ability to shock haul and his aggressive early game style of jungling. With this roster locked in and a name change to Determined Gaming, this team was considered the best challenger group at the time. Determined Gaming advanced through the group stages to face Evil Geniuses for a spot in the 2014 NALCS Spring Split. Determined Gaming was very confident in their ability to win this best of five. Broken Chart explained that he already knew Evil Geniuses was a very weak team upon their arrival in North America. When you get, you get into the actual promotion tournament and you get to get drawn against EG, now, people will see the result now and they'll think, oh, well, that's obvious, you know, EG had like pedigreed players and, the, you know, some of those players used to be some of the best in the world and all this sort of thing. At the time, every behind the scenes team was like, oh, by the way, we all destroy EG in practice. EG is terrible. They won't make it. That should have been like the dream draw. If you look at all the other teams there, the, all the other teams in there who were the LCS ones would have been harder than EG before, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone expected us to beat EG. We expected to beat EG. Honestly, we choked super hard at that event. Even in the video package before the best of five, Determined conveyed their confidence in this series. Crepo, Snoopy, and Yellow Pete are very familiar names to me. They might be big names, but I'm not scared. In the matchup, I don't think we have any specific weaknesses. I think that the the, on, the only close lane is going to be the mid lane, Arthalon versus Poe Belter, and Arthalon's going to destroy Poe Belter. I think Poe Belter's overrated. I mean, he can prove himself this weekend, but I think people overhype him too much. But despite the team's initial confidence, their results told a different story.
Game 1 saw lane swap by Arthalon and Westrice, with Arthalon playing Dr. Mundo and Westrice playing mid with Kha'Zix. This was a planned strategy for Determined, considering Westrice's champion pool mainly consisted of assassins and heavy damage dealers rather than what the meta was at the time, tanky sustained top laners. The early and middle game was even with kills being traded to each other. However, the full 5v5 team fights went in favor of EG. EG knowing that they're trying to get it done. Crepe are gonna go and flash down there. Oh, got it. Right off on top of it, the barrier. Ruger popped in there, lands it out. Maybe another box popped in there as well. And Barbara maybe gonna take him. He's broken down. Putting on the edge of the six. Not coming in as well. And Snoop I think the kill. Now Crepe in a whole lot of trouble on the owner. And there's just people everywhere. As Enoch teleported down. Mundo with the double kill. As Rivet's going in now. Broken down. Has to get out there as quick as the camera. Poe Belter roaming down there. Right nine plus short piece for the kill. And Arthalon, last but not least, gonna get stunned out there by Kiba. So West absolutely doesn't want anything to do with that. And a huge win for EG right there. After this momentum changing teamfight occurred, Determined Gaming never recovered throughout the entire series. The rest of the game consisted of individuals from Determined getting caught and more teamfights that EG took full control of. Evil Geniuses took Game 1. In an interview in 2014, Broken Chart described the feeling of the team following the shocking defeat. We were not the prepared mental team. Like, we were not prepared for a team. We, were, we expected to come in and destroy them because that's what we had been doing. We were coming in super confident. We were definitely expecting to, like, I don't I even care saying about this now. I honestly felt that we were going to 3-0 them. That's just the way that we've been playing. And when they came and we, we saw them prepared and, like, somewhat, you know, knowledgeable about what we play and they picked a solid comp and they had good picks in the first game, we were just like, well, shit, what are we going to do now? We, we were supposed to destroy these guys and we just went on mental tilt from the first game. The rest of the series was an embarrassment for Determined Gaming. Not only did they lose a ban in Game 2 for talking during a pause, the team also made a number of ridiculous individual mistakes. Robert Exley was caught at a level 1 and died. Bubba Dub seems to like it here as well, so lots of action, but Robert oh, Exley, oh, gets cleaved. Bouncing Bomb gonna move through, it's all flash starting there, and Robert Exley, very much and in trouble. The There's goal. a short fuse coming through, and Undertow's gonna clean him out. Broken Shard died trying to take his red buff. Smite early, <laughs> and he did not get the dragon with his smite. So it looks like it was a good call there. But props to EG. Yellow Pete did manage to pick up the slack there for Snooper, and he did get the first Woo! dragon. <laughs> As we are right. so let's the dragon. <laughs> uh oh. Let's take a look. The the EU jungler import that that they've gotten. Uh, red buff is very difficult. There's the broken shard smite, and looks like Lizard wins out in this fight. You win this time, Lizard. Tricky, tricky Lizard. Very tricky. Full broken shot there. The Baron was stolen by Pope Belter with a Mega Inferno Bomb. I have to see if he can actually come up with another hero play. This would be quite, they're putting it down. This would be quite the steal. Pope Belter's in range as well. The ultimate's coming in. He does steal oh it. He my. grabs the Baron. And Krepper pulls the back up, but he's baiting everybody else in. Broken shot dead as Krepper goes down in there as well. But Yellow Pete chasing him through there as he gets the kill. And Inox this entire time, he teleported before that Baron started. He's just taking out the base. In Game 2 and Game 3, Poe Belter decimated Arthalon in lane, both in CS and solo kills. Really hammering it on here in the mid once again. Oh, nice satchel there again. Ignite actually used it. Arthalon gonna pop away, but a great ult there from Zig. Oh, Poe Belter! Bouncing yeah. ball picks up first blood. Poe Belter was not tricked in the slightest uh, by the little pump fake there from Arthalon walking the other way. This disaster of a series by Determined Gaming conveyed the team's external weaknesses, such as LAN and experience and their ability to tilt very easily. But unlike any other challenger teams in similar situations, Determined Gaming didn't disband afterwards. Robert Exley posted on Facebook that the team would still remain and prepare for the summer promotion tournament. Around the same time, Arthalon left the team. On January 3rd, 2014, Prolly joined Determined Gaming. Broken Chart complimented Prolly for what he could bring to the team, citing better communication and understanding of the game. Prolly was also the only one in the roster with previous LCS experience, playing for the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster. With this improved roster and a renewed goal to make it into the 2014 LCS Summer Split, Complexity Gaming purchased Determined Gaming's roster. They would now be known as Complexity Black. Complexity Black came into the 2014 Challenger Series facing a different format introduced by Riot. The NACS was split in two series, Challenger Series 1 and Challenger Series 2. Each Challenger Series gave points based on where they stand on that bracket. Complexity Black was rated as one of the frontrunners for the Challenger Series, along with Cloud9 Tempest and Cognitive Gaming. After all, Complexity Black was chosen last in the previous promotion tournament, conveying how those teams did not want to face the then-determined gaming roster. However, a new foe would arrive in the Challenger series to threaten these frontrunners. They were known as LMQ. 
LMQ was a Chinese team that imported their entire roster to North America to compete in the LCS. They planned on utilizing the Challenger series to enter the LCS in the summer, the exact same pathway as Complexity Black. The community knew LMQ was a high caliber team and was predicted to be one of the top teams in North America. Their presence would first be felt by the Challenger teams and more importantly, Complexity Black. In the first Challenger Series final, undefeated LMQ was going up against undefeated Complexity Black in a best of three. This game showcased LMQ's skill to the entire North American audience as well as Complexity's attempted strategies to mitigate LMQ's signature aggression. Complexity attempted to match LMQ's aggression by having Brook and Tread invade No Name. This led to first blood for Complexity. There they are. Now they see each other. Damage. Oh, oh. Shield. E. Slow comes down. No Name now on the chase. Broken Shard's got to try to keep himself oh, alive he gets in hit this by one. Spear. Crawley's going to come in there first. Jumps back in with a stun. No Name loses a lot of health. There's a bomb. Broken Shard. One Auto hit. Q picks it up. First blood. Huge play right there by Broken Shard. Getting the jump on a No Name. And the biggest thing is the double buffs will be renewed for Broken Shard. <laughs> Are they, those are they chanting chants? US? No, they're USA chants for the Israeli jungler. Okay, that's nice of them. <laughs> for the rest of the game, Broken Shard kept up with this pace of aggression and it seemed to work, but the mid game turned in favor of LMQ. Broken Shard attempted multiple fights using Pantheon's Grand Skyfall, but LMQ ultimately won those fights. The Silly, who's gonna go for it? Xiao Wei Xiao gets hit up a little bit, pops barrier, does get away, kicked in towards the enemy team though. Broken Shard taking a lot of pain, has nowhere to go with this one. Locked up and killed by a jab with uh -oh. Robert X Lee. Also overextended, not all the places to go. Baba Dub also falls down, two for zero. West Rice joins the party a bit late, kills a minion and says, well, not the best fight. Once LMQ obtained a gold lead or map control, Complexity would not be able to regain it. In game two, the team attempted the same strategy, which ended in four kills for CLB. A 2v2 and look at that! The flash stunned him to West Rays. I don't know if he wanted this one. Running under turret though, Ignite is on and here comes Broken Shard, finds the shield. Ackerman oh, runs. No. Oh, the Ignite ticked! Oh my god, first blood! Broken Shard is there, that's gonna make it two. Wow, what a start for Complexity. That's gonna be the mid lane fight. Looks like the kill comes in there for Broken Shard. Having a good game, 2 0 and 1. But here comes No Name, they find more! He stays in too long, bump it up. Leave him alone, just let him die, just let him die. <laughs> or just walk away, screw it, that works too. Oh. The flash. Q, Vasily has no mana and he's not in range. No flash. They don't get anything for it! However, Broken Shard's aggression backfired once more in an invasion in No Name's jungle. Shao Wei Shao and Broken Shard about to find each other. Good damage in. The Q's gonna come through. Oh, he's got out. a teammate though, watch uh -oh. out! That's gonna be No Name. Broken Shard, can you get away? You are level 6. Can you get out? Barrel comes in. Kill picked up. A little bit too eager there. Yeah. One going back to LMQ. Afterwards, LMQ obtained the lead. During the laning phase, LMQ had played all of Complexity Black individually. Multiple times, members of CLB tried to 1v1 a member of LMQ, but lost or got caught out completely. Probably still looking though, Ignite is on, Q's gonna land, no flash of course. One more body slam could seal the deal. Drinks from the cask. Flash, oh, oh does not get oh, it, no. this is not good for oh, Probably. No. Little Lance lands, that's a kill. Shao Wei Shao with the outplay. The series went in favor of LMQ, taking first place in Challenger Series 1 and 9 points, while Complexity obtained second place overall and 7 points. While this was a loss for Complexity, they were still guaranteed a spot in the playoffs with their second place finish. In Challenger Series 2, Complexity Black only received 2 points. This is because they had to forfeit their best of 3 against Cloud9 Tempest in the round of 8 due to a Tournament Realm bug that plagued Complexity Black. As a result, they were unable to play the game in the designated time. This forced Complexity Black into the non-ideal third place seed that has no buy round. The remaining games were critical for Complexity Black to win, as only the top three teams would qualify into the promotion tournament. Complexity Black first beat out their sister team Complexity Red in the quarterfinals. However, in the next series against Cloud9 Tempest, CLB lost the series 2-1. They then had to face Curse Academy in the best of five to determine the last promotion tournament spot. Curse Academy forced Complexity Black into all five games of this series. Curse Academy was able to win games thanks to their superior objective control and their AD carry Mash. Oh, here's right Mashby, now. he's got he the point on the West the passive. Oh my god, so close! Oh, Robert he gets, them both. gets hit <laughs> down and the expunge is able to cancel out both on either side of him. The series was so close that it ended up coming down to one team fight where Curse Academy's jungler, Pat, was caught. There's no smite scare, so it's not a 50-50 smite off. Yep. K1 Broken Pro Shard. missing it. So much pressure here. Wild growth, they go in. It is going to be for They're Broken on the Shard. Me. The fight. Mash me gets taken out immediately, trying to throw down the summoners as well. Duosec is getting chopped down by Broken Shard right now, and they do find him. Complexity Black is coming up huge on the Baron fight. This should mean the game. Four games strong, and Complexity Black fell to be on the back heel. Win with game four. The momentum carried into game five. Now 50 minutes strong. It's only going to be Rux to back with Pat, and I think that's not going to be enough.
Complexity Black qualified for the NALCS Summer Promotion Tournament. The team once again had an opportunity to make their dreams come true, and it was most likely their last chance, as multiple members had confirmed they would give up their dreams if they failed this time. Uh, God forbid you don't make it in tomorrow, but are you going to keep you keep waiting around and see if you can maybe hit in 2015, or like how important is, is getting in tomorrow for you in terms of how long you want to stick around and, and hang out in the Challenger League? Um... I don't really know what's going to happen. Like, if I do make it, cool. But if, if I don't, then um, I didn't really have plans to, like, stay on the team because, like, we're not going to be able to keep Broken anymore because he's going to like, be deported back to um, Israel. So we're going to be down a jungler. And I don't know. If, it feels like it's going to get too old for me. And then I'm just going to probably, like, do something else and not play League anymore. But, um... Before we cover the promotion tournament, each player in Complexity Black had a significant story of sacrifice and dedication towards this dream unlike any other team. The community considered Complexity Black as one of the more deserving teams that should make it into the LCS due to their character and the story that each member possessed. Here are their backstories. Westrice is a prominent figure in the league professional scene with a rich history of his own beginning in Season 1. Westrice was a part of the Epic Gamer roster when they competed in the Season 1 World Championship as their bot lane carry. He was also known for his Akali and other assassins, showcasing his skill at the Season 1 World Championship. And Alistair is back, wow look at the damage that, that, that Akali does to Javelin. Yeah, Juke and she's going wow, for him. Wow, wow, that is Westrice on his game right there. You can hear the crowd loving every second of it. In Season 2, Westrace is on Team Curse's roster as their top laner and performed in most of the major Season 2 tournaments at the time. However, after Chris failed to qualify for Season 2 Worlds, he was benched in favor of Voiboy. Westrace left Team Curse a month later. Throughout Season 3, Westrace attempted to get into the LCS with a revamped Epic Gamer roster but was unsuccessful. Westrace was considered a veteran to the community but never found a successful team that enabled him to make it into the LCS. While he created a rep for himself as a Gallic assassin, the top lane meta evolved in a way that did not favor Westrice's playstyle whatsoever. Sustained ticky top laners were becoming more prevalent, especially when the 2v1 lane swaps occurred in Season 3 and Season 4. Westrace saw Complexity Black as his last opportunity to go into the LCS. If Complexity Black did not qualify for the LCS in the summer split, Westrace was going to call it quits. For Broken Shard, he was originally a part of the Dragonborns roster before they qualified for the inaugural EU LCS season, being a jungler and then becoming a coach. However, he wasn't happy with his current environment. Not only was he not pleased with the Dragonborns organization, he also faced tough times back home in Israel. During the time he was a coach for Dragonborns, he also assisted FXO. When TBD was looking for a jungler, Broken Shard immediately took the position and moved to America. Being in the LCS would allow him to apply for a visa and stay in America. If he didn't qualify for the LCS, he would have to move back to Israel. Out of the entire roster, Prolly was the only one with previous LCS experience. He was under the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster led by Lotta Mortis. During their midseason slump, Prolly rejuvenated the team with his plays and off-meta champions that worked. After being relegated by what would be known as Cloud9, Prolly still remained on Complexity. However, drama occurred between him and almost everybody else on the team. He was kicked off Complexity Gaming before the Spring Promotion Tournament. If you would like to know more about the full story, you can check out my documentary on the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster linked in the comments below. Prolly had proven himself to be a capable LCS mid laner mechanically. In terms of attitude, any problems with Prolly seem to be non-existent on this new Complexity roster. In fact, Broken Chart praised Prolly and declared him the best mid laner he'd ever played with. Uh, uh -huh. People didn't know that I was an EU jungler, and a lot of people give EU praise for its fantastic mid laners, right? And you know, I've played with a lot of different EU mid laners. I've played with Shushe, I played with Nuke Duck for some time, and I've played and I've been around and I played with Bjergsen even before. And I really have to say that Prawley and I, like, I've never meshed better with a mid laner than I have with Prawley. I don't know if it's because we're both half Arab or because we just have the same type of ideas, but I just could not I honestly don't know why, but we just mesh better than I've ever done with anyone else. We kinda know what we wanna do. Look at this guy, he's insane. <laughs> he he matches me. For Robert Exley, his journey in becoming a professional player was plagued by personal hardships and scandals. During the IPL qualifiers for the inaugural LCS season, Robert Exley was a part of the Absolute Legends NA roster along with Zeke and Cruiser the Bruiser and Nuppy Pooh Bear. On December 23rd, 2012, they faced off in a best of three against Team Dynamic. In Game 1, Cruiser allegedly experienced a technical issue that led to an extended pause. With spectator mode enabled in this one game and not the rest of the series, an informant was able to communicate information regarding Team Dynamic's war placement, enemy champion positions, and anything requested by the team all done illegally. This was the first incident of ghosting in the League of Legends professional scene. 
Absolute Legends lost that series, but the team later confessed. Riot punished the entire team including Robert X. Lee, disqualifying them from the remaining Season 3 qualifiers. This is Robert X. Lee's retrospective. So the incident was when we were trying to go for promotion. My team ended up ghosting. It was like stress from every single side. That was probably like one of the biggest impacts of my life, saying like cheating just should, shouldn't happen. From then, I told myself that I won from from having a tarnished reputation of you know I was told as a, like being told as a cheater and, and it was a really horrible feeling. The best way to do it was to just go clean from from then on. Not only was Robert X Lee's reputation tarnished by this ghosting incident, but Robert X Lee had an accident occur in his home while he was on FXO. Robert X Lee fell down the stairs and suffered a concussion. He later found out that he also suffered amnesia. Um, so, I knew I got a concussion because I was really tired. I wanted to go to sleep, but I knew that if I went to sleep, there's a chance that you could go into a coma. So, you know, I go play my game, and in Champ Select, there's a champion called Quinn that I couldn't recognize, and it caught me off guard because I didn't, I was like, who, who the hell is this champion? And I was like, and then my viewer said, yeah, even, you played this champion before, I, or... You played her a lot actually, and that's when I realized like okay something might be wrong with me. So I stopped streaming immediately. Go to the call my dad. He picks me up. We go to the ER, and you know the ER guy just says yeah you've been you experienced a concussion. Um, you shouldn't do anything for the next 24 hours. Robert was significantly affected by this amnesia and was unable to remember champions in the game. He forgot who his best friends were. He forgot what his occupation was and who his teammates on FXO were. In his Reddit post, he explained he had to make a new account because he forgot his own password. Robert was on the verge of quitting his dream because his performance had significantly deteriorated and he was having a difficult time playing for the team. Robert couldn't physically play League of Legends for more than a couple of hours before experiencing headaches and other forms of fatigue. Yet, Robert's parents and his streaming community convinced him to remain on the team and continue to chase his dreams. Robert was able to persevere from these setbacks and there he was at the doorstep of the LCS summer split a year later. For Babadov, making it into the LCS would be significant because he risked his own personal relationship with his wife, Stephanie, to pursue his dreams. When Babadov got out of college with an engineering degree, he wanted to go into the pro gaming scene. Stephanie was understandably against it. Stephanie and I met in college. Before we got serious, I basically said that I wanted to do this at some point in my life. Going into professional gaming for him was, how do I convince me that this is something we should do? At the time, the first response was, hell no. So the duo formulated a plan, a six-month ultimatum for Babadov to take a break from his engineering career to go pro, during which they used their savings from a year prior to help financially support each other. And there were specific requirements Babadov had to meet, such as being in the top 200 in North America as well as working full-time still. After Babadov accomplished this, Stephanie extended the ultimatum to a year, and Babadov only had to work part-time as a contractor. It was around this time that Babadov found his place in Determined Gaming. The next part of the plan was to have the house that Babadov and Stephanie resided in become the gaming house for the entire team. During this period, their relationship became tense. Stephanie hated the gaming house conditions, citing messiness and clutter from the team. Stephanie was torn about the overall situation, stating, On the good days, I could come to terms that he's making money doing something that he loves. On the bad days, I can get very snarky about him being stressed or not having time to talk when I need to talk with him. After all, it's just a game, it's not like work. I can go on forever how the system has no job security, idolizes a bunch of brats that have no ability to take care of themselves, and perpetuates a cycle of kids that have no real forethought beyond the game that they need to play next. If Babadov didn't qualify for the LCS, the six-month ultimatum would still be in effect. However, it would be Babadov's choice to continue this aspiration or go back to his career in engineering. With the backstories of all the players in mind, we come to the 2014 NALCS Summer Promotion Tournament. Team Coast pick Complexity Black first as their opponent, suggesting that CLB was the weakest out of the three. Everyone in the community predicted Team Coast to remain in the LCS. After all, their strengths came from the solo laners of both Zion Spartan in the top lane and Shifter in the mid lane. In Game 1, Zion Spartan single-handedly decimated Westrice. Nintendo camped top lane in order to get Zion ahead. Westrice couldn't 1v1 Zion Spartan whatsoever and had to give up all the turrets in the top lane. Here comes Westrace, but the turret is about to go down. That's picked up now. Westrace again to half. The chase still there. Has to flash. Zion lands the Q. Whoa. He goes in, but Broken Shard's there. He's going to make it a one for one.
while Zion Spartan was dominating West Race, Complexity Black won the two other lanes. However, Coast obtained a significant goal lead off of the fights they won in the mid game. The level 11 all for a second. Oh, the flash! The cocoon's gonna land as well. Zion gets the Mikhail's, but it's got nowhere to go. He flashes. Finally, safeguards away. The team keeps him just safe. Broken but he goes shard. back in. Crazy, man. Broken shard, way too aggressive. Now West Ray is forced to run away. The binding will not land. The Cullen comes through, hitting damage on above a dub, who's gonna go down as well despite his flash. Coast find two more kills. For the rest of the game, Team Coast held on to the lead, and Zion Spartan became so powerful he was able to outright ignore West Race to take the bot lane inhibitor. Zion ignoring the Renekton, just hitting it in the face. That's a little bit of damage. Says, you know, I'm gonna keep in this duel. Kicks him back. There's actually big damage in this fight. West Race a lot of not running. Double dash of the way he's gonna be safe. The game was looking like a Team Coast victory, but then a Baron call occurred. Can Zion get away? Top in hip respawns. Safeguard, but the Ooh. crit from Robert gets the kill, and a kill comes in they for Bally as well, plus the Baron for Broken Shark. It's a 5v3 on the map. He stole the Baron while Prawley gets a kill and Robert collapsed. With such large death timers, Complexity Black took the opportunity and ran it down mid, taking game one in a miracle finish. No one's gonna stop. They have to go immediately. They could actually win this game. 53 and a half minutes in Miraculous 2 because of the steal, because of the kills, onto the two carries. They're going for it right 40 now. seconds to go. West Race in front, gets the shields intended. Big ulti comes in. He's got shields as well. They put as much damage down as possible. DDB will land the stun and a bit of a slow, but the top turret is going to go down. Now for number two, do they have the damage? Wiz Fusion is trying, but Nexus turret number two is going to fall. Complexity Black trying their hardest. They're going to take down the Nexus for game one. Holy crap. In game two, Broken Shark showcased his Lee Sin mechanics and early game aggression with first blood and multiple ganks that help Complexity Black snowball. All right, there's the fight. Who gets the damage here in this one? The Q from Broken Shard, gigantic. And he gets the first blood of the jungle invade. Broken Shard starting it out early. He's going to take some damage. There's the old oh, no. Q lands. Hello. Broken Shard finds the damage and takes the kill. Broken Shard was playing out of his mind, continually affecting the game with his plays and stealing the dragon. Getting that means a pretty substantial gold swing. Unless Broken Shard could pull off another play, it's going to be a steal. He gets it and gets right back out. Complexity Black dominated this game, and they were one more win away from qualifying. Game 3 saw Team Coast bounce back from their two devastating losses. Daydreaming, the support for Team Coast, stepped up and uses Morgana Binds to catch Complexity Black members, leading to their demise. Absolutely has been, and Brokashar gets caught up with the cocoon. The traps are there as well. The rocket, Brokashar flashes. He's one hit from dead. Has to dodge away, kicks back Elise, goes in, jukes it, but gonna go down. Kill picked up for Coast, uh -oh. the catch on Bubba Dub. That's two now, Team Coast keep finding picks. In the top lane, Zion Spartan still continued to dominate Westrice for the third game in a row. Westrice was obviously tilted, and the casters knew because of the questionable plays he made. Westrice really late to the party at this time, and Coast had already finished everybody right there. So the entire fight was won before Westrice got in there. Shockwave was great, the catches were great. He goes down anyway. He is on full tilt at this point. Nine kills to one, 6,000 gold. Coast, full control, looking to take it to a game four. Team Coast halted ZLB's momentum with this win. In game four, once again, Team Coast obtained map control in the middle in late game. They are chasing down complexity. Flash Cocoon onto Robert. He gets exploded. Does not get any damage through. Now Prowley chased down, slowed up a little bit, and that's a kill. Two members alive, only two for CLB. At 43 minutes in, two inhibitors were down for Complexity Black. But then, a team fight occurred. And they go in. That's the turret going down. Zion, though, dangerously low. He's got to be careful. Kick back. Nintendo in the air. Ooh. He goes down. One for zero. The back lane running away. Shift are going to get rooted. This could be the fight for CLB. They pick up two kills. But where do they go? They're going to keep chasing right now. There will be super minions in their base. Probably low. Three kills. 60 second death timers here for you. Zion Spartan proceeded to teleport to CLB's base in an attempt to win the game. Zion Spartan's gonna find turret number one and there's minions coming to help. The recalls! Complexity Black, they won't get anything out of this but maybe a kill. But how much are they really recalling? Fusion going for the base on the other side. Prawley is back trying to finish off Zion Spartan. This could just be a base dance. It's gonna be Zion going down. That's four kills. After that failed, Robert X the Broken Shard found an opportunity to win the game. The inhibitor is not responding. Oh They're God. trying to win the game on the other side and take it into the LCS. There we go. Danger the only guy to defend. The turret going down. He goes for Robert. Here comes West Rice. This could 
might be the game. Complexity Black, they've got minions in the base. They kick back Nintendo. The Nexus is falling. Is it going to be enough? Robert it is. takes it down. Complexity Black make it into the LCS. Wow, Freak. Wow. Not one, but two games are one when they're pushed back to their base, losing one Nexus turret. And they end up taking the series 3-1. That could have went either way, easily. Complexity Black qualified into the 2014 North American LCS Summer Split, achieving their dreams. In part 2 of this series, we will go over Complexity Black's run in the LCS, as well as where each of the players are today. My name is Kudo, and thank you for watching. I hope he's not naked. I hear somebody talking. Wester Dank and Top! Wester Dank and Top, help! Oh, shit. Uh, no, it's just Travis, dude. Hello, Wester. Hello. Right. How's it going? Good. Well, anyway, let's leave him uh, to go back to sleep. I'm just testing his reflexes. He yeah. did good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>